We've talked about ancient times, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and the modern period, and so finally we come to the 20th century. This conclusion to our History of Neuroscience series is an important one because in the 20th century, the word neuroscience was used for the very first time. Hello Neuronauts, Cognic here, and today we are going to finish up our discussion on the history of neuroscience by talking about the 20th century. But wait, you're probably thinking, history doesn't stop in the 1900s, I want more neuroscience. Well, I make videos about neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy of mind all the time, so if you're into the coolest science around, consider subscribing to the channel and joining the crew. We'd love to have you. We begin today with a Russian scientist named Ivan Pavlov. Born in the mid-1800s but living well into the 1930s, Pavlov was the son of a village priest. He almost took after his father and started a religious career himself, but he became inspired by the Russian critics of the 1860s. He abandoned his religious career soon after and dedicated the rest of his life to science. Pavlov is best known for his work on conditioning and involuntary reflexes, and he actually won the 1904 Nobel Prize for his work on digestive glands in the body. You may have actually heard of Pavlov's famous experiments with dogs that led to his discovery of classical conditioning. While studying salivary glands in dogs, Pavlov became aware of something interesting. As expected, when food was placed in front of the dogs, they would produce saliva. However, sometimes, even with no food there, they would produce saliva if they heard the lab assistant walking by. Pavlov realized that the dogs had associated seeing or hearing the lab assistant with getting food, and so they had been conditioned to salivate when they saw or heard the lab assistant. To confirm his hypothesis, Pavlov actually trained dogs to drool when a buzzer was pressed, and thus Pavlovian conditioning was born. Pavlovian conditioning, also called classical conditioning, is still taught in psychology courses all over the world to this very day. Pavlov had competition though, and another Russian doctor named Vladimir Bekhterev was his most famous competitor. Bekhterev discovered 15 new reflexes and may have also been the first to discover the role of the hippocampus in memory. In 1907, Bekhterev founded the Psychoneurological Institute at the St. Petersburg State Medical Academy. He wanted to combine the forces of neurologists, surgeons, psychologists, philosophers, mathematicians, and members of other related fields to study the brain. Well, that sounds a lot like neuroscience if you ask me. 23 years after Bekhterev's death, his work and the work of others like him inspired Russia to create the Institute of Higher Nervous Activity in Moscow. Our next stop is with Dr. Charles Scott Sherrington, who was a bacteriologist, neurophysiologist, pathologist, and histologist. For one, his work popularized the term synapse, or the space between connected neurons. His work also led to the discovery of what we call motor units. A motor unit is a motor neuron and all of the muscle cells that it synapses to or connects to. Sherrington won the 1932 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his investigations into the functions of neurons. This work led to what we call Sherrington's Laws. Sherrington's first law states, that every posterior spinal nerve root supplies a particular area of the skin, with a certain overlap of adjacent dermatomes. A dermatome is an area of skin supplied by a single spinal nerve. Sherrington's second law is also called the Law of Reciprocal Innervation. It states that when contraction of a muscle is stimulated, there's a simultaneous inhibition of its antagonist. This is essential for coordinated movement because it means that when one muscle contracts, its opposite muscle relaxes. An easy way to think about this is with your eye. When your eye wants to look in a certain direction without moving your head, the muscle that pulls your eye in that direction contracts, but the opposite muscle to it, its antagonist, has to relax. If both of the muscles contracted, they would be pulling on your eye in different directions so your eye wouldn't really move anywhere. When one muscle contracts and the other relaxes, it allows your eye to move where it wants to go. Useful. In 1915, Sir Henry Hallett Dale became the first person to identify a neurotransmitter. He identified acetylcholine and its actions on heart tissue. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals that your neurons use to stimulate or inhibit each other. 
While you may have not heard of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine before, you've probably heard of the famous neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin. Otto Lowy, a German pharmacologist and psychobiologist, confirmed Dale's findings about acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter in 1921. Dale and Lowy shared a 1936 Nobel Prize for their discoveries relating to the chemical transmission of nerve impulses. Between 1902 and 1912, German neurobiologist Julius Bernstein moved forward the hypothesis that changes in a neuron's permeability to ions leads to the action potential. Permeability is a measurement of how easily something can pass through a barrier. When a neuron fires, it has to very quickly change the type and amount of ions on either side of the cell membrane. Changes in a neuron's permeability to different ions actually dictates how an action potential will work. To try to describe action potentials, Bernstein used the Nernst equation, created by Walter Nernst, to describe some of the permeability behavior of neurons. Scientists Kenneth Cole and Howard Curtis proved Bernstein's hypothesis in 1939 through their experiments on the squid giant axon. Let me clarify, not a giant squid axon, a squid giant axon. The squid giant axon is just a really long, thick neuron in squid that's really useful for neuroscience research. Cole and scientist David E. Goldman worked on membrane potentials of neurons as well, and in 1943 they created the Goldman equation for membrane potential. Kenneth Cole then went on to discover the voltage clamp technique in 1947, and it revolutionized neuroscience. Voltage clamp technique allowed scientists to make recordings of action potentials from single neurons, while also allowing them to control different aspects of the neuron, like its membrane potential. Finally, scientists could make neurons fire on command in the lab. In 1962, Bernard Katz described the communication between neurons at synapses, and the discoveries explode from there on. I can't talk about every neuroscientist and their contributions in the 19th century because that would take ages, but I'm going to go through four more really important names. David Riach is credited with inspiring and creating the connection between neurophysiology and psychiatry research. This allowed us to make great strides in mental health research from the 1950s and onwards because we could finally start to pinpoint psychological disorders to parts of the brain. In 1962, Francis O. Schmidt may have been the first person to officially use the word neuroscience. That year, he started an organization at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology, or MIT, and it was called the Neuroscience Research Program. In 1964, James L. McGaw opened the first neuroscience-only research program at the University of California, Irvine. At the time, he didn't call it neuroscience, he called it psychobiology, but that's also a pretty cool word, so nice. Finally, Stephen Kuffler started the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School in 1966. From here, it was on and upwards for neuroscience. In this history of neuroscience series, I've talked about a lot of scientists and a lot of discoveries, and there were a lot of details that I had to skip. In the future, I'll be making videos about some of the people and discoveries that I mentioned, and some people and discoveries that I didn't. We'll talk about the neuroscience of today, psychology, philosophy of mind, you name it. If that sounds interesting to you, definitely consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Take care of your brains, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.